okay. Welcome, more gamers, to part two of the Eden the Deepkin week. In part one, we talked about kind of the faction as a whole from a bird's eye view, and today this episode is called The Deep Places. We're going to talk about the different factions and sub-factions of the Deepkin as they really flesh out the character of this army. Now, rehashing just a few details from yesterday, when the Deepkin fled from Teclas, they went down to the bottom of the seas in the realm of light, which makes sense. It's probably close to where they were formed. The first Deepkin were called the Scythiae, which some choosing to pronounce that. And this term means the Awakened Ones. These are the originals, right? The first batch of souls to come out and try to be formed by Teclas. And when they went down to the bottom of the depths in the realm of light oceans, they found something called the Whirlways, which is a series of currents and tunnels that connect the deepest parts of each realm. And from here, they split into six distinct factions. Now, keep in mind, each of these has kind of their own little offshoot branches, but these are the six major enclaves, as they're called, which is like city or faction. So there's plenty of narrative space for you to make your own. Just pick the rules for one that you really like. The first faction is the Iron Ark, and this is certainly the most prevalent one. It's the one you see the most design for in terms of on the Games Workshop site. If you look at Deepkin models, they're all painted in the um, Iron Ark scheme. And they maintain a garrison at the first site, the one in the bottom of Realm of Light, but they've actually moved their capital to Giran, Realm of Life. They founded a capital city called Priom, and they are by far the most widespread of all the Deepkin. They hold smaller holds in each uh, realm, kind of scattered about, and it's noted they are by far the closest to Teclas' original vision for what the Deepkin were supposed to be. Very noble, very regal, adept at magic as a particular thing, very statesman and organized in terms of government, and they really highlight the most noble aspects of what the High Elves were back in the old world that Teclas tried to instill in his race. Now they're also unique in that they also make the most effort to stay connected as a race. They send envoys from each of their holds to have like a big council and make sure everyone's kind of in communication with one another, whereas just about every other enclave kind of breaks off, does their own thing, and stops talking to one another. This was the faction with kind of the biggest and brightest minds when it came to developing new types of sorcery, and so they were the ones who kind of cracked the code, as it were, on soul-stealing magics, and then they went ahead and shared it with all the other enclaves. And also notable, they have the only faction, or enclave, that is led by an original, meaning AI actual Sithae, I think as I pronounced it earlier. There is, to their knowledge, only one of these folks still in existence, and he is the kind of high king of the Iron Ark. We'll talk about him in a future video for sure. The next enclave to go into is the Domhain. This uh, term means deep questors. And the originals uh, from this batch ended up in Gur from the Whirlways. And it's important to note here that everyone seems to take on the aspects of the realm they're in. This was the same for Vampire Lords from Legion of Nagash book, and it applies to these guys as well. They are fierce, proud, savage, and even somewhat barbaric. Because when they came to Gur, as you'd imagine, the realm of beasts, they encountered the most vicious of all wildlife. Colossal monsters, lightning fast eels, dangerous terrain, everything like that. Half the population that came here died almost immediately just during their kind of immigration. But they were too proud to turn back. And when survival is the most important thing, you tend to kind of work together better, right? So this faction really banded together, they became closer to one another than just about any other enclave. They were fiercely loyal to one another and had to be for survival's sake. Now while they were kind of traversing Gur's oceans, they found a place called the Black Trough. It is a miles long stretch, uh, a huge trench really, in the bottom of the Omanad Sea. And in there they established the capital city of their enclave called Rundhar. And really what it is, it's built into the walls of this giant trench. And their kind of addition to society was that they had the first people who were able to kind of craft coral to build structures from it. They built towers and defenses and all kinds of stuff like that to physically build a society underwater. Because of all these things, they have really become a product of their environment. They are fiercely loyal because they had to be to survive. Very savage in combat, do a lot of hit and run attacks. They really love to use Achillean beasts, so like the big leviadons and the eels and things like that. But because of that, the other Deepkins see them as very primitive, very lowbrow. Because all of this flies in the face of sort of that high-end, noble aesthetic that Teclas tried to imprint on them. Next up is the Nautilar. This is a larger enclave that actually descended from the Iron Ark back in the day. And they just decided basically to go downward. They split off and went deeper and deeper into the oceans of Guran. On the ocean floor, they found this huge structure made of shells, basically 
As you'd imagine with an ocean, shells and bits and bobs from other animals kind of fall down and trickle on the ocean floor, much like it does in real life. And so they developed the Coralis, which is basically their ability to, much like the other guys, form structures out of coral, they do the same thing with shell. So they have this huge hunk of shell and more stuff falling down. With that, they're able to build these really elaborate and beautiful towers and defenses and things like that and really solidify a place at the bottom, deepest darts of Giran. Well, it turns out after a while that the ground started to move a lot and they realized that they had not actually found a huge hunk of shell, but it was in fact a living animal that they were standing on. They had built their society on the back of a colossal continent-sized creature called a Great Scaphodon. These things grow to vast sizes, and when they have offspring, which is not very often, but they have offspring that are the size of some mountains. And there's one little picture in the book, and it almost looks like a giant sea roach, like a cockroach underwater, with a colossal shell on its back. And it's actually turned out to be a very mutual relationship because they act as defenders for this giant creature and he gives them a home. And so they actually mold his shell to be a home for them. But this also makes them a mobile society. So the Scaphodon so far has gone from Guran to Gur, uh, seeking a different climate. But because they already went to Gur with these nice defenses, they did not have nearly as much of a rough time as the previous enclave. And for a time, because of these kind of perfect conditions, they were the fastest growing of all the enclaves, which is very important to know that your dying race, at least some of you are being thriving, really, until Skaven attacked. Now, if you're wondering how the Skaven got down there, remember they have gnaw holes. They can actually pretty much get to wherever they want to be. And any ether sea projection to allow the deepkin to breathe underwater would also help the Skaven breathe underwater. So they just opened a knot hole. There's not a whole lot of detail given to that story whether it's intentional or they just went the wrong direction. But the knot hole opens in the Notular capital, and this huge battle between Skaven and Deepkin begin. This is huge because now Chaos as a faction knows of the existence of them and at least where one capital city is. Now the Deepkin were able to push back the Skaven and make their civilization safe but the toll to do so was devastating. And so at this point in the storyline they are no longer the biggest race. They're still on the upswing like they're growing as a society but definitely not the number one place they were before. But this also brings up the fact that kind of their defining feature as a people is kind of their steadfastness in the face of whatever danger. Fourth up is the Futhan, and these guys moved and settled in the realm of fire. And just like their surroundings, they are quick to anger and thorough in battle. Now, a little side note here that they didn't go into too much detail on, but there was apparently a civil war between the Deepkin that no one else knew about, like above the surface of the water, lasted about 200 years. And there's a lot of talk that this enclave, the Futhan, actually caused that to begin with kind of their brashness. Because they are the most militant of all Deepkin, where most factions would spare children or leave the soul as kind of sleeping to die in peace, these guys have a zero tolerance for that. They slaughter everything around them. To the point where some other deepkin honestly just don't want to work with them. Their aggression has isolated them from their own kind. And matching kind of their fiery spirits, they tame the most destructive creatures they can find under sea. Next up is the Morphon, which means death-like stare or despair that can kill. And these are the deepkin that settled themselves in the realm of death. And it's noted that no other enclave is as insular as them, meaning they keep to themselves in the extreme. They're known for being kind of strange and dour, and they set up shop in the ocean called the Great Quagmire, which has very oily seawater. It's dark and foggy and kind of ominous. And these guys, as fitting in the realm of death, have become very adept at soul magic. I assume that they've been able to study what other factions in the realm of death have been doing. And so they really get the most out of their Namarti. We'll talk about it a bit. And they once had an offshoot enclave um, called the Eggmar, but the Eggmar was actually destroyed by the Skaven, again, through another gnaw hole that came up unbeneath, underneath them. Now, I have no way to confirm this, but there is a malign portent story about a Skaven kind of warband that's going and digging through gnaw holes, and they hit a certain point and water just bursts through. Well, it says in the Deepkin book that the ocean where the Eggmar were was drained. And that's when Nagash figured out what was going on. He saw them for who they were. So now he knows the Deepkin are around. And so I don't know if that Malign Porton story is actually relating to this specific enclave, but it could be. Regardless, the city was destroyed, their sea was drained, and now it has alerted Nagash to the existence of the Deepkin. And he's been searching everywhere to figure out where these souls are being stolen from. Now he knows they exist. And with that, he has sent legions of undead underneath the water, just meandering through the ocean, through the Great Quagmire, find more of these guys. And it's only a matter of time before he finds more fun. 
And lastly, there's the Briod Mar. This is another one of those enclaves that got really, really big until it left the Iron Arc, and they moved to a very claustrophobic area in the Green Gulch in Garan. They established their home in a giant, what I'm assuming is like tree of life, whatever, that tipped over into the marsh. Uh, it's called the Wood Citadel of Kronstock. And they really focus on the raider aspect of the army. They navigate terrain and defenses with ease and snatch their prey up without them even knowing they're coming. They have the most potent soul scryers, right? They've done the most research, unlocked the most secrets of the soul. And they're really the faction that's actively seeking a cure for the actual flaw itself. And my understanding is they raid so efficiently because they need a constant flow of test subjects and also to keep their society moving. So kind of in summation, when we're looking at these different enclaves, what stands out about them? Well, they each kind of take on a different aspect of the army or of the fantasy realm that this faction can kind of bring us into. I love the idea of the Futhon having created this civil war that like apparently was huge, right? It lasted 200 years, but no one above sea knows about it. So it's kind of a very self-contained thing. I love that idea that there's this entire second history that no one has any idea about. The Nachalar building their society on the back of a moving creature is a really, really cool thing. It's kind of a trope that's existed for a while, but it's very awesome that GW gave us a faction like that. I love that it doubles down the idea, and, and just like every book has, whenever a faction splits and goes to a different realm, it becomes different. And I think that that adds so much identity and character to these individual enclaves, rather than them all just being the same. There's a reason to make a Morphon one versus everyone being Iron Rock. So friends, tell me in the comments down below which one of these sounds the most interesting to you. I'm still trying to decide on what I want to do when I go to paint my army up. I'm leaning towards more fun because I like the dark kind of morose colors. But also the Briomdar at the bottom there strike me as particularly awesome. So go ahead and tell me your thoughts and what you'd like to see an army do. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time in my next lore video. Hey friends, I hope you enjoyed that video and I want to introduce you to some awesome folks. These are my patrons over on Patreon and they make this show possible by their direct support of me to buy battle tomes and black library books and all the material I need and the hardware support that I need to make this stuff possible. And if you'd like to join them, go ahead and click over to the Patreon page to the link in the description down below and you'll be introduced to a really awesome community of people talking about the hobby, sharing what they're painting. Uh, I invite them uh, to be part of polls to decide what content comes next. I raffle off every battle tome that I review, and we're having some great fun and discussions over there. So go ahead and check it out. Now, if you can't support in that way, that's completely fine. I'm just so glad that you watched this video here today. And if you have an Age of Sigmar lore question, go ahead and click subscribe and leave it in the comments down below. I read every single question and comment. I respond to as many as I possibly can, but I use them all as inspiration for future videos. So go ahead and do that now. And I look forward to seeing you guys on my next Age of Sigmar lore video. Thank you so much for watching, and happy wargaming.